So we obviously just came off our annual free flight trip or sometimes biannual. Is that right? Semi biannual? Semi annual? Sometimes we do it once and sometimes we do it twice a year. <laughs> this is public schooling at its best right here, folks. Um, anyways. And normally we get a lot of questions surrounding free flight right after that, and so we've had a ton of them. And although we have blog posts that talk about all the answers to those common questions, we thought we would make a video format of that as well. So you might notice comment too, sir, in the frame today. We have them outside on deck 13 in the golf net, just kind of playing and flying around and having fun. <laughs> Anyways, the first question that we always get about free flight is why? Like, why do we even do it? And it's something that's really hard to articulate. Um, I feel like if people come out and actually see the birds doing it, they will completely understand why we do it. The way that it makes a bird feel, um, at least the way that we see them feel, is why we do it. And we feel, I, I would say, we feel the exact same way uh, always, watching them experience it. And I always get the, um, I always try to explain it by basically saying, like, I want our birds to live with us by choice and never by force. And I feel like taking them outside and free flying, it's the ultimate test of if they, um, if our training is, is good and if our bird's relationship with us is strong, it's just that ultimate feeling of just having a bird, it's like walking a dog off leash. Um, you know, the fact that you know it's not gonna run away is awesome, but when you can watch a bird flip around and dive into the canyons and, and coast in the wind, and it's just an amazing feeling that, um, <laughs> It's, it's hard to explain until you get to see it, but a lot of people that have come out to watch us free fly on our annual trips, um, they they kind of get the bug as well, and they understand why we do what we do. Yeah. The other thing, like the, another another top question that we get about free flight is what about predators? And that's why we travel to places that are safer to fly than where we live. We've, we've flown in a lot of different places. Um, we've obviously lived in Florida, and we have flown there, but it was never really that great because one it was super flat and two we had a lot of bald eagles and red-tailed hawks so it just wasn't ideal and although we wanted our birds to get outside and try it we just didn't really keep up with it because it wasn't very fun in Florida it wasn't very safe and it was it was too high risk every time we do this we always look at you know just understanding the risk management you know um, well, that's one reason we are in Moab Utah all the time is because there's there's very few predators there are bald eagles to actually I want to share a little story about that but um, there's there's some hawks and everything, but the ravens chase away the hawks. So if you hear a raven calling where we fly, um, it typically means that they're chasing away one of the other uh, predators. And so the yeah, ravens very, in our way are kind they're of They're very friends. territorial birds, and we haven't had issues with them with our birds. They seem to understand that we're just there temporarily and not moving in on their territory. So they don't bother us, but they definitely do um, drive off hawks. So that's why we like to fly near where ravens are. Um, we also have had a few hawk encounters. We had one, um, was it a Kestrel hawk? It's a little, little American Kestrel. I think it was in ah. Nampa, Idaho. We were flying while we were on tour and it actually came after Comet and I got video of it like dive bombing him while, while he was flying and Comet didn't even wince. He was not phased at all. Um, another time was actually in Florida and we were flying our three medium sized birds. That's Cressy, Bondi, and Bandit. Our two rose breasted cockatoos and African gray. And I believe Bondi and Bandit were in flight. Bondi was higher than Bandit. Is that correct? I don't remember how they're how they're laid Bondi out. Bondi was higher than Bandit, so Bandit was the lower one. And a hawk was actually had been sitting in the tree that we were flying sort of near, and literally dropped right out of the tree, and immediately analyzed the situation as the birds being too healthy for it to want to go after, and it left. And it was literally, it just dropped out and it was a second where we could compare the size of the hawk compared to our birds and it was mind blowing and super scary. I believe I cussed in that video. That's another one we got on video on YouTube. Um, but anyways, it was just a quick thing. So one of the things that we learned from falconers because we, we reached out to falconers to find out a lot more about predatory predatory birds. We wanted to know as much as we could about them so we could choose places that are safest to fly, uh, the time of day that's safest, the safest seasons, um, learning weather patterns and how they how they hunt so that we can fly the safest and just minimize the risk as much as possible. And one of the things that we learned is that hawks and other predatory birds will basically instigate something and they'll just, just to test out 
those birds or whatever they're gonna eat. To see if that animal is healthy or not. Uh-huh, so if they show that they're like sick or injured, then they'll go after them, but if they show they're too healthy, a hawk or a predatory bird doesn't want to risk getting injured um, because then it means it can't survive. There was, so. It was a pretty cool time to um, this last trip in Moab, Utah. Jason Byers got married, so congratulations again to Jason and Sarah. And uh, they wanted to do the free flight trip as kind of a joint thing. We got out there, and uh, the weather was amazing. The cloud coverage was, was really, really cool. And um, then these two guys pull up in a car, and they say, Hey, what are you doing? And we're obviously there for a wedding. And, and they say, Hey, a buddy of ours, Graham Hunt, is going to go wingsuit jump off this cliff. And we're always flying right by this cliff. And so I, I tune into what frequency they're on the radio, and lo and behold, we hear over the radio he's getting ready to jump. So we're all watching the cliff. He jumps off the cliff. He dives down the wingsuit, and our birds are, are screaming because they see this, you know, flying object that they don't know for sure what it is. But the other thing about this that was really cool is, is Graham sat up there on top of the cliff, and he went on the radio, and he said, hold on, guys, I'm not flying yet. There's a bald eagle circling below me. And he's like, this is just too iconic. This is too surreal. I'm going to sit here and wait until the bald eagle's done. Well, the reality of that is that we had been flying the birds for that entire time with the bald eagle there. And so the important takeaway from that is just understanding that because uh, predatory birds will often, like we just said, engage the animal to see if it's weak or not, it's important to never throw your birds. Um, like, it's, it's hard to explain because you might see videos or pictures it looks like we're throwing them, but we, we usually give the birds a choice to be able to hold on if we don't if we get the feeling they don't want to fly, they'll hold on to us and we don't force them to fly. And that's because they either see a predator or because sometimes they don't feel well. We had that happen with Bondi. One time she actually was sick. She didn't want to fly and so she just sat in a tree and, and, and hung out because she knew that was a safer spot within the limbs of the tree as opposed to just sitting out and being uh, predator bait. So uh, pretty cool experience to, one, to get to see somebody wingsuit fly and and two, to have it be so iconic with the bald eagle flying and, and us flying and, and Jason and Sarah getting married. It was really a, it was really a cool moment on a, on a perfect day. Hello. That's a lot of them coming. Hello. Hello. <laughs> They're getting freaked out. <laughs> so one of the questions that we get a lot of is, why don't we train this on a DVD? And although we do have a DVD course where we explain it, um, we don't typically sell it. We'll give it to our free flight students. Uh, the challenge with doing free flight is everybody is different, everybody's birds experience is different, and of course every bird is, is unique in its own situation. You can compare Bandit to Bondi, and both being rosebreast and cockatoos, they still fly differently, they respond differently. There's so many variables that we really can't, don't feel like we should put it on a DVD as a, as a here you do step A, B, C, and then that's it. Because, because there's, it's really there's... not A, B, C. Like when, for instance, we had, um, one of our very first flight students was a blue-throated macaw named Tika, and she was about two years old. She had already escaped outside on accident and been gone for like five days, was found 40 miles away. Um, her experience was completely different, and she was trained in two months. I mean, it was like our best students ever. They put so much time and energy into it. Tika was amazingly skilled. That was amazing. But then we have a Moluccan cockatoo who's 10 years old or 11 years old, Pooh Bear, and he took over six months of one-on-one -on -one training, plus more, plus more. We had we had different interactions in Reno where we'd meet up with with Kai. We would meet up with uh, we'd meet up with him on the flight trips. There was it was really six months of just to get him outside into what we felt was safely. Um, but his story was different too because he's older and. Um, and, and he was already he was already outside. going outside. They yeah. were already doing it on their own. They just wanted to progress. And the thing with who was that he really liked landing on other objects, such as, such as like parked cars or um, like or a fence. railing somewhere, like a fence. So his his methods and like what we instructed Tika versus Pooh Bear to do were completely different because we had different things to work through. So every bird has gone through a different situation, living with somebody different in a different environment, and those people are reinforcing and not reinforcing certain behaviors and habits that we have to either undo or continue on. So everybody's um, information that we give and how we train them is completely different. We haven't trained anyone identically the same. We also had another person who, um, we, it's really been all over the board. We had another another guy in Idaho who, um, I trained him in, in a month. He had a brand new baby bird, it was the right age for the bird, and I was able to train him while on tour and literally less less than a month, he had him outside free-flying. Um, 
So it really depends on Every on so many variables, you know, so it takes a month to six months. Really depends on your bird and all that. So we prefer if you start with a baby bird uh, that, that you're finishing the hand feeding, we could do it pretty, pretty consistently within about three months. Um, that's kind of the window we like to shoot for. And again, we do do this privately with one-on-one -on -one with students. Um, it's a pretty big fee, but it's because it's a huge time commitment on everybody's part. So um, depending on how you do the course, we can do that. Although I do, do want to say like, because we don't usually recommend that people hand feed without proper experience because you can, there's so many things that can go wrong and the bird can die and it's just horrible. And we've also had students that, actually Chris isn't even a, a student actually, but he has a bird that he raised from a baby and did flight and a bird that he rescued, and his rescue bird is way better with free flight. It's a miracle story. So it's not like you can't do it with a rescue bird. You totally can. You just have a lot more issues. You, normally, you're spending all your time um, undoing bad habits versus just focusing on the flight training. Like with a baby, the reason that we do it with babies is because they're naturally fledging anyway, so you're just kind of working within the natural process. You're just expanding on the flight stuff, whereas with a, with a bird that you're rehoming or that you just adopted, you have to work through so many bad habits that have already been created. And with babies, there's so much more room for air because the birds are naturally fledging, they're naturally coming back to eat. There's there's so many, uh, there's just so many behavioral things that are in your favor, where if you mess up, you're not gonna lose the bird. But obviously working with an older bird, the more you mess up, the more chances you have of losing that bird. So yeah. um, that's, that said, that's kind of that. it's a lot more training than it is, like there's no baby bond stuff or anything like that. It's 100% training. Yeah. Um, obviously you want to spend a ton of time with bond with your bird, but it's it's a lot of training. And all, all of our birds, I believe, took about three months. About, yeah. 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 Now, now another question we get is, uh, uh, have we ever lost a bird? And we've never lost a lost a bird, like we've we've misplaced them. <laughs> we had a situation with Cressy, we were actually filming a teaser for a pilot, um, a TV show, and, and basically Cressy took off. She ran out of energy and she crashed. And we spent four hours looking for her. And it was one of those things where it was like, do we, how long do you keep looking? What What do you do after you can't find the bird for four, five, six hours? Um, we've done all the safety precautions ahead of time for that, just knowing, you know, knowing the weather patterns, it was a good day to fly based on what we've learned about how predators um, hunt and when they hunt and all that. So everything we had done was, was really as good as we could. We did warm up flights, we did everything we could but what happened was Cressy just was out of shape and she crashed. And so when we stopped looking at everywhere frantically, we sat down on the edge of this uh, ravine and I said, man, last time I saw her, she went up and over here. We never saw her come back up again. So sure enough, we went up and over here and looked and there she was the entire time. It hadn't moved. It like a big pile of poop just sitting yeah. there waiting for us. She sat there. And we literally, we walked figure eights around her. Like we're lucky we didn't step on her because we have those walkie talkies that track your, um, your footsteps and we saw like where she was and we had literally just we were so frantic and so emotionally freaking out that we just couldn't think properly and so we just practically stepped right on her I mean there were footprints really close we to hit her. about six it's feet ridiculous. of her yeah. oh, but one of the lessons we learned on that was to uh, right it's a ghostbuster <laughs> one of the lessons we learned is anytime that something like that happens um, where it's not what you're wanting um, to not freak out and that's easier said than done but you know we've been in the situation enough now with people who uh, had a bird crash as well or even Cressy's crashed a few times since then and we haven't had as many issues because we quit freaking out when you quit freaking out you can just stop and think okay she was going this direction the wind was doing this she was tired she was going down in this general area she has to be right here there she is yeah you know? and a lot of things we went through with Cressy is we actually didn't trust her for a few years in there and like we wouldn't we'd be really hesitant to fly her and now she's one of our most trusted flyers. We don't have any really hesitations good. about her. Um, one of the things that we did in that process was if we saw her crash and we knew where she was, we would just wait it out and let her figure out how to come back. Um, you know, the first time it happened, obviously we completely freaked out emotionally and, and like went looking and stuff. But now when she crashes and we can actually like see her and we have eyes on her, we just wait for her to come back on her own and, and it's really helped her recall and helped her get back faster. And yeah. now she doesn't even do that anymore. We, we talk more about that in depth in, in some of our courses, like I said, with the private training and stuff where we, we really go in depth about all those little details and, you know, and the reasoning behind why we do what we do and um, from a training standpoint, behavioral standpoint. So anyway, yeah. never, never officially lost a bird, but the, the key to that with Cressy is just making sure that she's a little bit more 
conditioned before we go flying. That's kind of the big takeaway. we got was um, somebody lost their bird outside and then got it back and they were wondering how they should respond. <laughs> Comments climbing up Dave's leg as we speak. Yeah. Hey buddy. But they were wondering how they should respond to the bird um, now that they got it back home and everything. And uh, Dave and I were talking about it and we were just saying like shower it with love. You know it's an accident when birds escape outside because they left a window open or a door open. So it's not the bird's fault and the fact that you got it back is awesome so you should be rewarding that behavior. I think even more important than just that is is uh, spend a lot more time training the bird so if it gets outside, it understands how to recall and come back and descend. That's a huge one. Make sure your birds understand how to descend if you have a flight, if, a fully, if you have a fully flighted bird. Um, but but ultimately, just train the bird when you get it home, and uh, and, and don't punish it. They don't understand that. I can't remember that. Ever use a harness to flight train? On the last question is, have we ever used a harness to flight train? And we have. We don't typically recommend it. Uh, I think it's very unique to each situation, but we had Bondi, a rose-breasted cockatoo. We had raised her from a baby, but we didn't understand this whole flight training thing at the time. And so we did use a harness with her, and it was really, it was more for us than it was for her. She didn't need it, but we were too afraid to let her go. And uh, she's probably one of our most skilled birds, one of our most skilled flyers now. But it was cool, the feeling when, when we took her off the harness, she looked at us like, really? <laughs> really? And like the pent up excitement and energy that she had when she did that first flight off the harness was- Amazing. It was so cute. And she like, was grateful that we trusted her. It was a really cool feeling. Yeah. But um, you know, if the question's being asked because you want to use your harness to flight train a bird, you just have to be super careful. You know, I've heard too many stories of, of birds on harnesses with a leash fly off anyway, and now they stand less of a chance of surviving because they've got a long harness, a uh, long leash attached to their harness, they can get tangled, they can get caught in so many things, and uh, it can be very, very, very dangerous. So well, we used to take Bondi out on the odds. harness all the time, and we would put like a weight at the end of the uh, leash so that in case we did drop it, or we'd put one of those little carabiners and we could like hook it to a, a belt buckle or something, um, just to be extra precaution for safety. I used to have the but, carabiner with my keys on it, so that yeah. knowing that if, if I dropped it or she flew off and tugged, she wouldn't go very far, because the weight would keep her within six feet of the ground. Yeah, and the other thing is that we'd, we, um, we just found the harness as far as flight training really cumbersome. Like Bondi didn't associate it, associate flight training positively because she was more worried about this friggin' thing on her body that was just irritating the heck out of her. So for us, for our personal experience, we prefer doing it without. But that's also because now we're, we're, we're experienced in flight training, we know how non-cumbersome it is without one. So um, I do think it's like a good thing to, to work on, especially with birds if you're gonna take them everywhere with you and everything. But you just gotta be really careful and take extra precautions so you don't drop that leash anyway and have your bird get tangled. But it's getting really windy out here. I think we're gonna take off. <laughs> So the winning comment this week is from Sue. Thank you, Sue, for your comment. It was awesome. We actually had a lot of people say the same thing at our bird show this week. And so it just was kind of like constantly in my head this week. And that's kind of why I went with your comment. Um, I just love that the fact that you're admitting that as people, we are also being trained and we need the positive reinforcement as well and the reminders. And I just thought it was such a great great little reminder for everyone. We got asked a lot this week if Dave and I used the bird training methods on each other and our daughter, and so your comment just seemed to be perfect this week. So please email us at info at and let us know which product you would like. Flight. In all of the animal kingdom, this way of traveling, this mode of movement is the most complex, most skilled, and undeniably the most stunning. Hundreds of tiny muscle adjustments each second 
In the time it takes for us to blink an eye, a bird is constantly calculating and adjusting for wind, avoiding obstacles, gauging distances, and at the same time, keeping an eye to the sky for predators that would do harm to them. It is these amazing animals that we call friends and bring into our lives as companions. And at its height, this special relationship results in these amazing creatures flying with and among their human friends. This is the story of a group of these extraordinary birds and their human companions as they search for nature's most stunning vistas to fly in. Come along on the adventure, on the adventure of the freedom of flight.